Good morning, everybody. Hey, hey, good to see everybody this morning. Uh, I'm sure we've got a good number of people joining us uh, right now online and um, kind of give them a minute to get on. It's been a great week. Uh, the Lord is shining bright upon his church. The body of Christ is growing. We have a lot of things to pray about this morning because of all the things that are happening out in the world. And boy, I can tell you, because I know what I'm going to be teaching this morning, uh, there are a lot of real life lessons right now being taught. And and we can learn so much um, just from the things that are going on. We can see how God is moving. We can see what God is doing. And we can understand what part the church has to play in all of this. So before we get started this morning um, with our lesson, and we'll have communion after uh, we get a little worship in, let's go to the Lord in prayer. We've got a couple of things we want to pray about. Uh, number one is we need peace and cool heads to prevail over our nation right now. There are a lot of instigators out that are kind of ginning everybody up so that there is a lot of things happening that shouldn't be happening. And, it, you know, I, I really do believe in what Dr. Martin Luther King taught us, that love prevails over everything and, and peace will calm everything down if we are peaceful. So we want to pray about our nation and all these things that are going on right now. There are horrible things happening besides the coronavirus and, and now riots all over the nation. And so much of the world is looking in, at, at us in America. We need to be Christians in every way that we can possibly be. And the best way we can start is, is through prayer. Now, um, we also want to just give thanks. Chris, uh, Christina Cup's dad, Bill Menz, had heart surgery on Wednesday and is recovering. And the doctor said everything went perfectly, which is exactly what we wanted to happen. And uh, I believe that they did the best work that they have ever done. And he is receiving all of that right now in his body. And we just thank the Lord for it. He He's truly been blessed. So we want to um, pray and then we'll go right to our worship this morning. And uh, Brother Justin and his family have a couple good uh, songs for us this morning. So we're so blessed that we've been able to get a little bit of music and a little bit of worship in over these last, what's it been, 10 weeks or something? Crazy. But next week, live, Messiah Community Church, 6969 Montgomery Road. We're going to be there, and we're going to be worshiping again. And Betty will no longer be sitting behind me playing the part of Roxella. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. <laughs> Heavenly Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus, we pray over our city, Lord God. We pray over, over Cincinnati, Father, that peace and calm would come to our city, Father, that believers everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and fear and doubting, Lord God, would call upon you, Father, and you would heal this land. Father, we call for peace to settle over Cincinnati and over Ohio, Lord God, over all the major cities. Father, we pray, Lord God, for all the major cities in the United States and all those places, Lord God, that are experiencing turmoil. Father, we pray, Lord God, for the family of the dear brother, Lord God, that, that lost his life. Father, we pray over that family in the name of the Lord Jesus. Father, we pray for, for him, for his family, for the life that he left behind, Lord God. We pray, Father God, that it would not be in vain, but that there would be Father, a peace that comes over this nation and, and some real changes made, Father, as a result of everything, not, not the things that we're seeing right now, Lord God. And we pray, Father God, that all those who are instigating in, in the United States for violence, Father, that they would be exposed. Father, the Holy Spirit exposes all things. Father, expose them for, for what they are and who they are, Father. And we pray, Lord God, that Peace would prevail over the hearts of the believers, that believers, Lord God, would begin to rise up and shine forth as a noonday sun, Lord God, over this nation. Father God, we pray, Lord God, for strength in the heart of the believers of this nation. Father, not only over this coronavirus, 
but over all the other things that are trying to tear us down and pull us apart. Father, peace will prevail because we are one nation under you. And we just thank you, Father, for it. We thank you for your hand of glory on the United States of America. Father, we will shine forth to the world as a place of peace and prosperity and a place, Lord God, where your hand is upon us, that they might know the blessing of the Lord. And Father, provoke other nations to jealousy. Provoke Israel to jealousy, Lord God, that they might be redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Father, we thank you for it, Father. We praise you, Father, for Brother Bill Menz, for his, uh, for the great testimony of the, the surgery that uh, the doctors did on his heart. Father, in Jesus' name, he will recover with all expediency. And Father, he will be better than he was before. And we just thank you and praise you for it. We thank you, Lord God, for his life in Jesus' name. Father, this morning, as we go to worship you, to honor you, to lift you up, we pray, Father God, that you just bless us now with peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. And Father, we thank you, Lord God, for the lesson we're going to have this morning. Shine in our hearts. Reveal yourself to us in Jesus' name. Amen. Brother Justin, you ready? Hopefully. I don't see a camera yet for him or or a microphone on. All right. Well, let's move on to communion. Oh, if you can hear me, Justin, try logging off and logging back on because you, you were in there as a presenter. So you should be able to turn your mic on. You should be able to do all that. So let, let's go to the, um, to the Lord and we'll have communion together this morning while we're waiting to see if those guys come on. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and he broke the bread and he passed it to his disciples. And he said, eat this, for this is my body that is broken for you. Now, on that night, he was telling them really how to be healed. Because he was telling them that he, Jesus of Nazareth, was going to be Jesus the Christ, the son of the living God. And his body being broken was being broken for our healing, for the healing of, of humanity. Not just healing spiritually, but healing physically, healing emotionally. He was telling us that healing was going to happen for us when his body was delivered up. So we want to... Lift him up and eat this morning in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's eat together. Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you that we are healed. Father, we are healed by the broken body of Jesus. We are healed physically. We are healed spiritually. We are healed emotionally, mentally. In Jesus' name, we thank you and praise you for it. And then Jesus took the cup and he raised it up to his disciples. He passed it around to them and he told them, he said, when you drink of this, you are drinking to a new and everlasting covenant. You are drinking a drink that will seal forever an eternal bond, an eternal bond between God and man that makes everything that Jesus did on the cross makes it real, makes it true, makes it happen. And so as we drink this morning, I want you to remember how glorious, how amazingly glorious it is, the work that the Lord did for us, and it is eternal. Let's drink together. Heavenly Father, you have one glorious covenant with your people, a covenant, Lord God, that cannot be broken by man, a covenant, Lord God, that cannot be taken away or eradicated by anything that we've done. But Father, it is forever engraved in the hearts in heaven, Lord God, a, a, uh, a covenant, Lord God, that is 
forever written for our health, our wholeness, our healing, our joy, our peace. And we thank you for it in the mighty name of the Lord Jesus. And everybody said this morning, Amen. Amen. Well, praise the Lord. I'm I'm waiting for Justin's family. I can see it uh, turning around here. So let's give them a minute and see if they, they get logged in. You know what? I know. Well, we're going to be talking this morning. Um, I, I've been talking about hope. And, and I've taken the last couple of weeks to talk a little bit about um, hope and, and what hope is and, and how hope works and the um, the glory that is there in hope. So I, I want to take you this morning and talk again um, let me let me give Justin a signal. I, I think he can hear me. Uh, it's saying that your camera's not active, Justin, and your microphone's not active. So you might want to check that out on your computer and just let me know when you guys are logged in and we'll we'll take off from there. The I want to talk this morning about love beyond hope. Because listen, love is something that every human heart needs. Every single person needs love. And and regardless of the situation, regardless of where we've been and what we know, what we what we thought we knew, um, there isn't any situation. There isn't any situation in life that presented to us that love cannot prevail over. Because the word says love never fails. It never fails. Now, we have a hard time understanding that because we, we, we have a a really a convoluted idea of what love is. Well, I want to talk this morning of, because we are, as believers, we're called to be hopeful people. We're called to have an expectation of hope. We're called to have an expectation of what God is going to do and then expect him to do what his word says. Because after all, he says, I send my word out and my word's not going to um, it, my word is not going to return to me void is what the Lord says. Well, because of hope, we, we have like positive energy, positive hearts and all that. And, and yeah, Richard, that was a great comment. We also have a convoluted idea of what failure is. Oftentimes what we see as failure is kind of like Joseph back in the old Testament saw, you know, if he looked at his life and he ended up in prison for a long time, uh, because everybody kind of just let him go. Um, and he was betrayed by, you know, Potiphar's wife and all of those things. He, he could look at that and say, well, look, I failed. But he, he chose not to. When Abraham was wandering through the desert, he could have looked and said, you know, I've been wandering a long time and I haven't gotten to this land. Lord, you said you were going to give to me. And by the way, there is very little conversation between Abraham and God through that whole course of events. He's traveling and God, you know, isn't talking to him every single day and and trying to uh, uh, juice him up with, you know, flattering words every morning. Hey, Abraham, good morning. It's so nice to see you again. No, we, we hardly have any recorded conversation between God and Abraham, except for when it was important. And, and so as we as we look at the relationship that we have with God. Oftentimes, what we see as failure, God does not see it as failure at all. God sees it as an opportunity for our success. Well, in hope, we keep hoping through those failures, but there does come a time when it seems like, man, I, I've been hoping and hoping and hoping, and it ain't just, it, it just ain't working. You know, I know that's bad grammar, but it's just not working. It's not working. And, and our hope starts to fade. Well, I want to let you know this morning, there is a love that is beyond hope. There is a love there for us that is beyond how far our hope can take us, how far our hope will have us be. Our hope is out there. When our hope starts dwindling, and as, as a result, it seems like we have no faith, and it seems like we have 
just failure looming over us. We can rest in the fact that there is a love, a love from God for us that goes beyond how far we're humanly capable of hoping. I want to take a look at a scripture here in the book of Deuteronomy chapter 6. It says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. Now, here we have God is giving um, his scriptures to the nation of Israel, to his law. He's giving his commands, his statutes, his ordinances. He's laying it all out for them of, of what it's going to take for them to have a relationship with, with him according to what they asked for, which was tell us wh- how we're going to act, tell us how we need to act, and, and then we'll love you. Oh, yeah, we'll, we'll have you take care of us. You can be our God if you just tell us how you want us to act toward you. And, and so God didn't ask for that. What God asked him, just love me. Well, they, they wanted to know what it took. So he starts out, and this is how he responds to them. And he says, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. <clears throat> now, that's important for us to understand that the Lord is one. He's not many. He's one. The Lord is one. Now, for the nation of Israel, they had to start pulling that together because, remember, they just came out of Egypt. Egypt was a place where it had, it had a multiplicity of gods. I mean, there was a God for everything in Egypt. And, and they had fallen into some of that worship because, after all, they were in Egypt for 400 years. You're not in a nation that is foreign to you, that serves foreign gods in that And they're doing that all around you without there being some influence on you, especially if you're sitting in captivity. Things look grim. Now you're a slave. Now they're having you build buildings and make your own brick for it. And and they're making it harder and harder and harder for you to live and exist. Sounds like what a a lot of um, people are doing to freedom these days, making it harder and harder to be free. Harder and harder to be a Christian. Harder and harder to to live your life as God intended you to live it. Well, it's easy to see that there can be multiple gods. And there are multiple gods today. I mean, people worship, you know, MTV. They worship uh, people in in secular media. They they worship people who are stars and, and, you know, in movies and on television. People worship. Uh, the stock market. I mean, let's be honest about it. People's lives are are up and down according to the stock market. So here, here we are as a people of God. If we're like Israel and the Lord comes and he says, listen, the Lord, your God, the yud heh vav your God, he's one. Now, what does that mean to us? Let me let me break this down a little bit for you. See, in Egypt, they had a God they went to when they needed sunlight. They had a God they went to when they needed rain. They had a God they went to when they needed their crops to grow. They had a God that they, they went to for everything in their life. They had a God that they could wanted to go to or God that they needed to go to in order for that God to, uh, to do for them what they needed done. So if they needed peace, they had a God to go to. If they needed joy, they had a God to go to. If they needed rain, they had a God to go to. So they had all these gods to go to to have the thing that they need. Let me compare it to something we're all familiar with, addiction. If I need peace because my, you know, I just can't handle the world and all that. So I need peace, right? So I go out and I try and get peace. Well, sometimes that peace comes in the form of a needle. Sometimes it's in a bottle. Sometimes it's in a pill. Sometimes it's in a joint. There's a lot of things I can go to to try and get that peace. You see, really, these other gods are all things that men go to in order to obtain what God's already provided. If you're going to something in order to obtain that which God has already provided, 
that thing in reality has become a God. What God is telling them, the nation of Israel here is, I am the God of your peace. I am the God of your joy. I'm the God of your healing. I am the God of your prosperity. I am the God of your victory. I am the God who reigns over you in everything that is needed for life and godliness. I am the God for that because the Lord, your God, the one that you worship, the one that is now come to you and said, I will be your deliverer. That Lord is one God. That is the same thing that Jesus did when he went to the cross for us. Whatever ailment we had, whatever thing was in our life that was preventing us from worshiping and honoring the Lord God of heaven, Jesus came and he said, listen, the Lord your God is one God. He is completely and totally comprised in me. He I am the makeup of that one God. So I am your peace. I am your joy. I am your salvation. I am your prosperity. I am your healing. I am everything that you need. I am one God. And that's what the message was to the people of of Israel. That's what the message is to us today. The Lord is one. We don't have multiple places to go to. I was talking to somebody one time and they were a church, a church floater. You know what a church floater is? A church floater is somebody who goes to this church to get this, this church to get that, this church, that church. They don't really tie into any one body of believers. And, and so therefore they're not in, under any um, direction of any single pastor or any single body. They're not accountable to anybody either, which is kind of just a little side note, right? But, I've talked to somebody who who was like that, and they, they, they said, oh, yeah, you know, I go over to here because I get the teaching I need over here. And I, I go over here because they give me the uh, I can have the worship that I want. And, oh, I, I, I like Beth Messiah over here because it gives me a little taste of Israel, you know, a little Hebrew mixed in there. And I go to this church for Wednesday night. I go to that church on a Thursday night. And I said, man, don't you get confused? Oh, no, it's it's wonderful. That way I get everything I need. And I said, yeah, but the, the Lord says we got to be a member of one body. We're, I mean, we're all generally a giant body of believers anyway, whether you're Methodist, Episcopal, Pentecostal, Catholic, it doesn't matter. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, we are all members of one body. And we should all have the same teaching. Unfortunately, that's not true because of the the way the devil has div- divided and conquered really the body of Christ. But I was when in my conversation with him, I said, Should, shouldn't you just go to one place? Because what happens when you have a need? What happens when when you have something that you really desperately need from the Lord and you need your brothers and sisters in Christ? and Nobody knows you because you've been floating all over the place. Oh, no, 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 the body of Christ was ever, all these people I know. Listen, folks, there is something different about being a member of a body that is your family. That's what the Lord's telling them here. You are one nation. I am one Lord. I am the one God who is over you. And when you call upon me, I will be there for you. Now he tells them, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your strength. That means the entirety of your being is to love him. You say, well, why would he tell them that in the midst of all of this stuff, all these laws and commandments? Because he wants them to know, listen, I want to love you. I want to be able to supply all of your need, but I want to do it on my terms. The only way that's going to work is if you love me. If you love me for who I am, for what I'm providing for you, if you love me for everything that I say I am, for my love for you, if you love me because of my love for you, then the it is limitless. It is infinite what I will do for you. Now look at how he follows. In these words, which... I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and you shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down and when you rise up, you shall bind them as a sign in your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house 
and on your gates. Now, here the Lord is telling them in no uncertain terms, my word's important to you. My word has to be passed down from generation to generation. Your children have got to know who it is that I am, what I've done for them, what I'm going to do for them, how I'm blessing them, because it's the only way that they are going to be able to extract from me all of the favor that I have for them is if they know my word. If they know my word, if they know what it is I'm giving them, boy, that's a lesson. That's a lesson we need today. Uh, that, that's why there are, there are quite a few churches that really stress Sunday school because they want to get into the minds and the hearts of the, of the children the word of God. And it's important that our kids know the word of God. It's important that they grab hold of it. It's important that they understand not just memorize scripture, but they understand the heart of everything that is there. Because if you will understand, that's the reason why he says these words shall be in your heart. He doesn't say, hey, memorize these words just so you can recite them off sometimes. No, he doesn't say that. He says, put them into your heart because it is with the heart that men see. Not with the eyes, it's with the heart that men see. We we have to have that love of God in our heart because when it's in our heart, when we understand that he loves us and it's in our heart, it is different than understanding that he loves us in our head. You see, because when hope goes out and when hope starts to wither and when hope can no longer produce faith and, and when hope starts to look like it's in the in the rearview mirror, if you understand what I mean. Some of you might be able to say an amen right there. When hope seems like it's in the rearview mirror, it is in your heart that you will know that God loves you regardless of where your hope is at, regardless of where your faith is at, regardless of what the experience of your life is. You have to know that God loves you as a factual part of your existence. The only way for that to happen is if that is in your heart. He says, so it shall be when the Lord your God brings you into the land of which I swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give you large and beautiful cities, which you did not build, houses full of all good things, which you did not fill, you now wells, which you did not dig, vineyards and olive trees, which you did not plant, when you've eaten and are full. He says, beware of success here. Then beware lest you forget the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. You see, hope and faith can all go in the rearview mirror when you have become faithfully successful. Listen, I've talked to a lot of believers that have hit, the, I mean, like the pinnacle. I mean, they're, they got houses here and there and everywhere, millions of dollars. I've been in conferences with people who who were just like faith giants, it seemed like, you know. And in the midst of all that, they talk about their faith, their faith, their faith. When it really isn't their faith at all. It is God doing everything he had promised he would do. And therefore, we turn our eyes to him and we say, Lord, you, you are God. You are one God. You have provided it all. And you've given us provision beyond our year, beyond our understanding, beyond anything that we were capable of having, you have given us provision for. Now, take a look here at 1 John 4, because this brings it back to today. New Testament believers. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him. God abides in him. That word abides is an interesting Greek word because it means he takes up resonance. He takes up resonance. God abides in him and he in God. When we confess, that word confess, homologeo, I've taught this many, many times, homos, to come in complete agreement with, to be in complete agreement with. Logos, to come into complete agreement with the word of God. The entirety, the thought, 
the intention of God's heart. Everything from Old Testament to New Testament, all the way through the book of Revelation, to come into complete agreement with all of that that God has. Whoever confesses, whoever comes into complete agreement with the entirety of the thought and the intents of God's heart in all of his word concerning Jesus, the Son of God, that Jesus is the Son of God, that Jesus is Messiah, Jesus is the Redeemer, Jesus is all in all to us. He is everything that holds everything together. When you come into complete agreement with that, God abides in him. God abides. He takes up residence in you and you in him. Then he says, and we know, and we know. We don't think, we don't hope, we know. This has now become a factual part of your structure. We actually become known to God. We actually know God and believe, listen to this, and we have known and believed. So we've known it's in our heart, can't be dislodged. It's in our head. We understand that our heart is right and believed. We don't just know, we believe. So it's a factual thing, but it's also a fact that is believed. I, I can give you a, some facts. And people, you know, it's like uh, we just watched SpaceX launch, right? Going back up in outer space, right? For the United States. Beautiful thing, man. It was gorgeous yesterday watching that. And, and so, so here we watch and we see uh, SpaceX has gone up, right? And they said, we're going back to the moon. There are people to this day who will say the moon landing never happened. It was done in a studio in Arizona. And, and uh, they made it look like the moon. And, you know, the guy didn't really plant a flag on the moon. He planted a flag in a studio and, and they have they, they can reason all of it out and not believe a fact that we actually went to the moon. Now, I hope I'm not offending anybody and you're going, well, wait a minute, that was done in the studio. No, listen, nobody could have done that. It's just a fact. We did it. There are other things that are fact. And there are people who will look at fact and they won't believe fact. There are people who will look and say there cannot be a God. And I have fact to say that. And we have fact to say that there is. Because there is no way that all of this could have accidentally happened. There is a difference between just knowing something, having a fact, and knowing and believing. You have to believe the fact. So, so now we have that we know the fact that Jesus is the Son of God. And we also believe the fact that he is the Son of God. We know and believe the love that God has for us. We know it and believe it because of what Jesus did. We know it and believe it because of everything that he has done for us. We know and believe it because it, we are still talking about it 2,000 years later, that a man went to a cross in the city of Jerusalem. A man went to a cross and died a cruel death, worse than any man had ever undergone up until that point in time. And to top it off, all of the wrath of Almighty God was poured out upon him on that cross so that he suffered both spiritually and physically. That is just a fact. We know it and we believe it. That fact shows us that God loved us. God is love. And he who abides in love abides in God. So if we, if we abide in the love that God has for us, in other words, if we abide in Christ, then we abide in God, in God in him. Now listen to what it says and why this is so important. Love has been perfected among us in this. Love's been perfected among us in everything that was just said. Love has been perfected in us. It has been matured in us. It, it has been completed in us. Love has been perfected among us in this. That, that word there, love has been perfected among us in this, speaks of everything that John just said. Us believing, knowing and believing in the Christ, the Son of the living God, that everything that Jesus did makes love. 
abide in us. Now here's why. That we may have boldness in the day of judgment. The day of judgment here is not talking about the end time judgment of the world. This is talking about every judgment that comes on the believer. Every judgment that comes on the word of God, every judgment of man that comes on anything that happens in our life. You say, well, pastor, how do you know it has it has to do with right now? I mean, why can't this be talking about the day of judgment? Yeah, we're going to have boldness on the day of judgment. No, we're going to have awe on the day of judgment. We're going to have worship on the day of judgment. When we come to the great white throne, we as believers are going to be standing there with our mouths open just in awe of the magnificence and beauty and glory of God. Listen to the next phrase that he connects. This is how we know it's here. Because as he is, because as Jesus is, not as Jesus was, as he is. Because he is alive, he's seated at the right hand of God the Father, ever making intercession for us. Because he is the crown prince of heaven. He is the Lord of lords and king of kings. All things have been put under his feet. Because as he is, because he is there, full of glory and light. Because he is there with, with all of the angels subject to him. Because as he is, not as he was, as he is. So are we in this world. So are we in this world. It's a great white throne. We're not going to be in this world. We're going to be in the heavens at when that happens. Because as he is, so are we in this world. So as we are in this world, the judgment is the time that we are in this world. It is all the things that have happened to believers. It is when we go out and, and, and people say, well, aren't you afraid of COVID-19? No, I'm not afraid. I mean, I'm I'm not stupid either. I'll, I'll wear gloves. I'll wash my hands off and I'll put a mask on. I'll do all the things that I know to be good for not spreading this thing. But I'm not in fear of it because I, I don't I, I don't bow to things. I listen and I worship the Lord God Almighty. I live and worship the God of heaven. I live and worship who he is. Listen, we're going to we're going to worship in just a minute with Justin and, and his family. And, and we're, this is what we're going to we're going to be worshiping to the love of God. We're going to see what God has done for us. And we're going to know that this love has been perfected among us. And, and when we sing, we're going to lift our hands and our hearts to know the rain that heaven has for us, to know the worship that is there for us. Because when the day of judgment comes in your life, the day of judgment might be your boss or your company telling you, hey, we're sorry because of COVID-19, we're closing the doors. The day of judgment might be when the doctor tells you you're seriously ill. The day of judgment might be when you receive a foreclosure notice on your house or a tax bill you can't pay. The day of judgment might be when your neighbor, uh, for whatever reason, hates you and decides he's going to bring suit against you or he's going to start tearing your house up or something like that. Or it might be when you're just standing in line, you've got your Christian T-shirt on and somebody turns around and starts making fun of you. That all might be. That all might be the day of judgment. That all might be the day of judgment. Now, you say, well, well, how is that the day of judgment? Because your faith is being judged. Your hope is being judged. Everything's being judged. And what you need to know is this love of God. You need to be abiding in. You have to know that beyond when your hope runs out, God still loves you. When your hope stops, God still loves you. When your faith cannot be produced because you just can't get up enough hope to have any faith about anything, God still loves you. It has to be a factual part of who you are because as he is, so are you in this world. As he is, so are you in this world. When judgment comes, so are you. You're just like Christ in this world. 
and the love of God is perfected in you. Take a look at Psalm 91. I've been praying this over Betty and I and, and over our church. And, and, and when I think about different parts of this, I just speak this over us. When we have communion, I, I'll say that no pestilence is going to come near us. There's no plague that's going to overtake us. Because you are our shield, our high tower, our, our buckler. You are our shelter. We abide under the shadow of your wing. And then look at verses 14 through 16. Because he has set his love upon me. Because he has set his love upon me. Now, you might say, well, this, oh, yeah, well, that's talking about, uh, you know, that's, that's not talking about God setting his love upon us. It's talking about because we've set our love upon him. Because we have set our love upon him. This is God talking through the psalmist. He, because we, me, because I have set my love upon you, Lord. Therefore, I, this is the Lord speaking, therefore the Lord will deliver him. Therefore, the Lord's going to deliver me. Therefore, the Lord will set me on high. Because I, because I have known his name. Because I have known who he is. In other words, when he says, because he has known my name. What, it, what that is saying is because he has known everything about me. Because he has known who I am. Because he has known factually who I am. Because he has known in his heart who I am. Because he has known. Because mankind. Because I, the believer, have known who God is. Because I have accepted the fact that Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus the Christ of Nazareth, the one who went to the cross, the crucified one, because I know that he is the Son of God. Because I know that. Because I know who he is. He has set me on high. He shall call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. Listen to this. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. With long life, when you know who God is, when you know and you, you have him here in your heart, you are abiding in him. You understand that regardless of where your head is at, love goes beyond even the hope that you can muster up. The love of God goes beyond everything, and he will show you his salvation. 1 John 4, there is no fear in love because perfect love casts out fear, because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. You see, fear is an enemy of us. Fear is an enemy of ours. Fear tries to grab hold of us, whether it's a virus or a riot or it's a lost paycheck or whether it's a, a son that's out there that is wayward. Fear grabs a hold of us. Fear grabs a hold of us and will stop us from believing the best. This is what we need to know. We love him because he first loved us. We love him because he first loved loved us. If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he's not seen? Wow. And this commandment we have from him, that he who loves God must love his brother first. When we have that in our heart, when we know that compassion is in our heart for everybody, listen, I know it's tough. I know it's hard. I was on the road the other day, and um, this guy just came over on me, you know, and and it like he didn't even look, type thing, and and I was thinking, man, I ought to just blow my horn, and and, and we ought to, you know, I'm gonna yell at him and and all that, and then I thought, let it go. Yeah, Bet Betty said my conscience got me. Yeah, my conscience did get me. 
Oh, my conscience that the angel, the Holy Ghost sitting in the seat next to me, right? Uh, this this beautiful uh, little brunette, she said, don't say anything. I was already thinking that really, you know what I mean? I, now, I my head was about ready to pop. Uh, seriously, because, I mean, you know, when somebody just does something to you and and they pull over on you like that, uh, like this guy just cut me off. And I was like, uh, he doesn't have any business doing that. As my head is going, before anything came out of my mouth, before I was uh, able to even beep the horn, um, Betty said, just let it go. And, and my heart was already saying that, just let it go. Show the love of God. Well, we have to as believers. Our head doesn't always think that way. Our head doesn't always do what's right. But our heart knows the love of God. And when we know that he first loved us, regardless of where our head goes, regardless of where our hope goes, regardless of anything else, when we know the love of God, when we know the love of God, we can be love in this world. Take a look at Romans 5. And this is where I'm going to close. Romans 5, 5 through 9. Now hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. For when we were still without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. How is it that we know that the love of God is there? This is why hope doesn't disappoint. This is why even when hope is way in the rearview mirror, even when hope is way behind us, even when hope can't be mustered up, even when we look at each other and we go, man, did we just mess up totally? Is this not going to work? Even when all of that is happening. Because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts and the Holy Spirit makes it known to us that his love has totally been given to us. When we are without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man someone won't even dare to die. But God demonstrated his love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Being justified, when our heart knows that we're justified by the blood of the lamb, how can we be anything but in love with him? See, that's when love goes beyond your hope. That's when love can go beyond any hope you have for mankind, any hope you have for life, for your family. That's when love can go beyond that. That's when you can pray differently. That's when you can worship differently. That's when you can do life differently. When you know in your heart the love of God, when you know in your heart that Jesus died for you when you were yet without strength, when you were still sinner, you can, you can have some hope when you think you're righteous. You can have some hope when you think, that you're a good man. You can still muster up some hope there. But when there's a time that comes when hope is way behind you and you don't know, or maybe hope is not behind you because things are so bad or things haven't worked out, maybe everything has worked out exactly so that you don't hope anymore. You've got everything that you could have hoped for. How many people have said that? I have everything I could have hoped for. Well, listen, love takes you beyond even that. When you have everything that you hope for, love will go beyond that place of hope and give you more hope for more things. More hope for a greater experience with God. More hope for everything you could have ever dreamed of. That's how big God is. That's how awesome he is. I, I was hoping, I was hoping this morning 
that all the equipment would work right. And we would have some good worship music here for you. At the end, we would we would still have it. But it doesn't look like the equipment's working right. So the Lord already knows. All right, I can do that. Stefan said he, he needs his tablet turned on. So let me pre promote him up to a presenter. And then we'll see how that works. Maybe, maybe we'll still get a little bit of that music because I have been hoping this morning um, that Justin is, um, everything would work there. And, and I don't know why it's not. But what I want to get to is in this time, in this world of chaos, we need hope. We had a prayer request for Ellen Wright's uh, son, Skylar. Um, he's in the Ohio National Guard, and a lot of those guys have been called up because there's been riots in several cities in Ohio. And in the same way with young men, sons, all over this nation. And there are those who who absolutely just hate God. He said, well, Pastor, you don't know that all, you know, a lot of these people that are starting these riots and that are doing this, you don't know that they're all not believers or they're not this, that, and the other thing. Listen, we just read for you in 1 John. If you can't love your brother whom you can see, if you can't love your brother whom you can see, how can you love the God that you cannot see? You see, that's really the test. That's really the judgment. That's really where the rubber meets the road. If we can't see, if we can't see in ourselves to love the brother who's right next to us, even the ones who are ungodly, even the ones who are hateful, even the ones who just can't get there, how can we love the God that we cannot see? So let's pour our love out for people. Let's pour our love out for each other. And let's pray for Skylar this morning that the Lord, we know Skylar's heart. He loves the Lord and the protection of the Lord is around him, keeping him, watching over him, along with all the other men that are going out to bring peace in all the different places of our country. There might be somebody this morning that doesn't know Jesus listening. You don't know who Jesus is. You don't know the heart of God. Maybe you've been in church for a long time and you don't know the heart of God. You, you know the scriptures in your head, but you don't really know the love of God in your heart. We want to pray for you this morning. We want to pray that God touches you, that God brings you all the way around to know, to know, to know, to know that you know. And your knower, you know, that God loves you, regardless of the situation of your life, regardless of what you've experienced, regardless of what you know in your head. God loves you. And he cares for you and he's working everything out together for your good. I want you to see this morning how great and how vast his love is for you. That hope never fails. It never disappoints us when we know it's based in the love of God. So if you don't know Jesus as Lord and Savior, just say this prayer in your heart right now. Jesus, help me. Jesus, save me. Deliver me. And let the Lord deliver you. Let the Lord heal you. Let the Lord touch you this morning and bring his, his grace upon you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you and we praise you and we love you. We love you, Lord God, with all of our heart. Father, we know the love of God. We know it's not based in what our head says. It's based upon the fact that Jesus went to the cross, first loved us, poured out his love for us, so that when our hope runs out, when our joy runs out, when our peace runs out, Father, when everything that we can muster in our heart to believe runs out, the fact that Jesus Christ 
the Son of the living God, died for us, went to the cross, and is now seated at the right hand of God the Father and is making intercession for us. That very fact brings us to know and believe and understand that you love us. And because you first loved us, we love you. And we thank you for it. And we praise you for it. And we honor you for it. Father, touch all those this morning who are online with us here, Father, that are within the sound of this, my voice, that, that are going to listen to this message, Lord God, later on. It, it, Father, touch their hearts. Let them know the love of Christ. Let them know that love that passes all understanding. Father, to know the peace that is there in that place, to know the joy that is there in that place, to know, Lord God, the security that is there in that place, to know the prosperity that is there in that place, to know that they know that they know that they know and they can abide in Jesus abiding in his love, abiding in that love so that they can love each other and love mankind. Father, we pray for Skyler right now, Lord God, a hedge of protection around him, Father, that the armor that you have in your arsenal and those angels who are with them, with his company, Lord God, with the group that he goes out with to protect people, protect properties, Lord God, that, that the angels that are with him are more than those that are against him. Father, that he has a shield about him and that he knows and understands that you are the glory and the lifter of his head. And Father, for all those young men and women, Lord God, who are out there protecting the property and the, and the people, Lord God, of this nation. Father, that they have within their hearts, within their lives, Lord God, a great protection a great understanding in their heart, a factual understanding of how much you love them. Father, protect them, keep them, watch over them. Set your angels around them and bring peace to our nation, Lord God. Let this nation, regardless of the instigators, Lord God, regardless of those who want violence, regardless of those who want hate, Father, let them be flipped on their heads and exposed for who they are. And let the crowd turn on them, Lord God. Let the crowd turn on them and bring love into their heart, Lord God. We ask you, Lord God, for the salvation of all those instigators, all those people who would want violence, all those who have hatred, Father. They are the ungodly. Show your love to them. Show yourself strong to them. Turn their hearts around and expose who you are to them. And we praise you for it. Bring peace to our land. Heal our land, Lord God, in Jesus' name. We love you and we praise you. Amen. Listen, we want to thank you for joining us this morning. We do miss the worship from the step from the Lamberts and the Joneses. Oh man, I was looking forward to hearing it. Save some of that music. We'll hit you next week. Get you guys singing some more. Uh, listen, join us next week. We will be live at Messiah Community. And I I want you to um, understand we love you desperately and we want you safe. If you have any fears whatsoever about coming next week to a live service, please stay home. We will still be broadcasting. It'll be on YouTube as well as being on uh, any meeting. And you, you'll be able to get the the program. You'll be able to see what's going on. You'll be able to hear and be able to participate. Please join us next week. And if you can, but if you have any fears, stay home. If you have a fever, or any symptoms of anything, please stay home. We understand you. Listen, you can get the same word over the internet. Now, if you're healthy, whole, and you have no fear, we expect you there. Amen. Amen. We love you all, and uh, I want to just put this challenge out there. We have um, got $940 in toward our gym floor. We have a, a, uh, a donor who is willing to match up to $1,500. So we need another $560 to get that match, the fullness of that match, and I believe we're going to get there quickly. And 
we, we understand any amount is, is wonderful. Any amount that gets us there is great. We're going to have a new gym floor before the summer's out. I promise you that. Guarantee you that. And we're going to have a usable gym, not just for a gym, but for weddings, receptions, meetings, all kinds of community things that we can do because we're going to reach out and, and love the Lord your God, right? Amen. We love you. Make sure you go to the website, give your, your offering, your tithes and your offerings for this week. We appreciate it so much. Continue to mail in your offerings. Um, we're going to work that out and have a box there next week. We're not going to be receiving it uh, as we have. I'll explain a little bit more about that next week. We have a little different procedure as we get there. We sent you out a letter. You're going to have your communion right up front. Just be prepared and bring your mask. Uh, we're looking forward to that. It's a new fashion statement. Amen. We love you all. Be blessed in the name of the Lord Jesus. Have a great week in Jesus' name.